Hi guys, and welcome to the Stephen King Cemetery Club. Hi guys, welcome back to the Haunted Valley. Today is part four of the Stephen King Cemetery Club's discussion of Salem's Lot. Now, today we will cover chapter 11, which is Ben 4. And we will go through chapter 13, which is Papa Callahan. Matt is in the hospital because of his heart attack. And Ben is also in the hospital because he got beaten up by Floyd Tibbetts and he had a head injury. So Susan goes to visit and they all are talking in Matt's room. And the doctor comes in, Jimmy Cody. They ask to speak to him after his rounds, so he's going to look at Matt, then he's going to go meet up with Ben and Susan, and they're going to discuss things. So they're going to tell Jimmy everything. So they talk to him about exhuming the body of Danny Glick, and Jimmy agrees, because logically he's thinking that, you know, if there is nothing to worry about, then it will just be a dead body, but if there is something, then better to know. So he has agreed, but they are still going to talk to the Glicks to get permission to exhume the body. Ben and Jimmy go to the Glicks' house and they find out that Marjorie, the mother, is dead. And Tony, the dad, has been taken to the hospital. He's in shock because, I mean, in just a few weeks, both of his children have died. Well, one is technically missing, but both of his children are pretty much dead. And now his wife is dead. So I can imagine that he is going through some stuff. So Ben is thinking, quote, things are going very fast now, too fast to suit him. Fantasy and reality had merged. And I feel like that's a very apt description of just the rest of this book. Like, this book is such a roller coaster at the end. It's just constant action and all this crazy stuff happens and it keeps your interest and even though Stephen King writes in these little sub chapters you devour them and keep going so Stephen King books are great because you can read just small sections at a time you don't have to wait for very long to get to like a page break or you know a change of scenery or characters something like that so it's effective in that it keeps you interested and it makes you not care that they're short because you just keep reading them anyway. So they might as well be long. Does that make sense? Marjorie Glick has been taken to Maury Green's mortuary. And Jimmy had saved the life of Maury Green's son way back in the day. And so he's going to cash in on a favor for Maury. So they go there and they ask if they can sit with Marjorie Glick's corpse. So now we cut away from Ben and Jimmy and they see that Susan has decided to go to the Marsden house on her own. So she drives out there on the way. She sees a snow fence and takes one of those picket fence pieces as her stake because she is going to fight this vampire. And she also stops at a little store and buys a crucifix. So she parks, goes through the woods up toward the house. She even thinks as she's going that she always thought girls in movies who went to investigate noises or went to do things like this were really dumb and she would never do it. And here she is doing it. So Susan is aware of the trope of the girl going to investigate or the girl putting herself in a dangerous situation. And here she is doing the exact thing that she says she wouldn't do. So I guess at least she's aware of it. But she is really nervous, really freaked out. She feels something isn't normal. And so she's crawling up the, the side of the house in the woods and she kind of chides herself and she says, quote, from the front yard, you can see your own house. Now what in God's name could happen to you in sight of your own house? And that's on page 388 to 389. So at this moment, Straker leaves. So he takes his car and she sees him go and turn off into town. So she knows that he's not at the house anymore. 
and then we could flip back to Ben and Jimmy. And Maury hands the keys over to Jimmy. You know, he agrees to let them stay up with Mrs. Glick. And Maury says, quote, if she says anything, write it down for posterity. He began to chuckle, saw the identical look on their faces, and stopped. That's on page 293. So, Maury, poor Maury, he's gotten himself into this. And while Jimmy and Ben are at the mortuary, um, Jimmy kind of does like an examination of Mrs. Glick. She's very dead. She doesn't look so dead, but she is dead. And a little bit after sunset, she rises and it's so beautifully described. Like the sheet that's covering her twitches and you can see her hand fall out from under the sheet and start wriggling. And there's a huge fight between Marjorie, Ben, and Jimmy. Ben is trying to stave Marjorie off with a tongue depressor cross that he fashioned and then blessed by praying over it. And Jimmy kind of circles around behind to try and grab her. And when he grabs her, she throws him across the room and he crashes into a whole bunch of stuff. And she's very strong and she's on him. Like, I think they described like a spider. So she's quickly on him and she's biting him. The quote, Jimmy Cody screamed, the high despairing scream of the utterly damned. That's on page 398. So, you know, it's really concerning that Jimmy has been bitten and Marjorie is still going after him. So on page 399, let me find it. Okay. Ben is trying to help. So he approaches Marjorie and quote, he grabbed her by the collar of her housecoat and yanked her upward, forgetting the cross momentarily. Her head came around with frightening swiftness. Her eyes were dilated and glittering. Her lips and chin slicked with blood that was black in this near total darkness. Her breath in his face was foul beyond measure, the breath of tombs. As if in slow motion, he could see her tongue lick across her teeth. He brought the cross up just as she jerked him forward into her embrace, her strength making him feel like something made of rags. The rounded point of the tongue depressor that formed the cross's downstroke struck her under the chin and then continued upward with no fleshy resistance. Ben's eyes were stunned by a flash of non-light that happened not before his eyes, but seemingly behind them. There was the hot and porcine smell of burning flesh. Her scream this time was full-throated and agonized. He sensed rather than saw her throw herself backwards, stumble over the television and fall on the floor, one white arm thrown outward to break her fall. She was up again with wolf-like agility, her eyes narrowed in pain, yet still filled with her insane hunger. The flesh of her lower jaw was smoking and black. She was snarling at him. So this continues, and he corners her, and then he's going to jab the cross right on her, on her face, but she kind of dissipates into like a, a foggy mist type thing. So I always loved this scene, and I really enjoy the what they do in the movie, but I feel like they could have done more in the movie. So after Marjorie Glick has vanished, Jimmy is freaking out because he's been bitten. He's got blood, you know, running down his neck and he felt something when he saw the cross. He felt like angry and just filled. He was becoming a vampire or whatever. He could, he could feel her poison or whatever working in his blood and he gets Ben to give him a tetanus shot in his armpit and he upends a whole bunch of some sort of disinfectant so probably some sort of alcohol into this gaping wound with their mangled mangled teeth marks so Jimmy doctors himself and it's really interesting because I always think you know, when someone gets, I guess it depends on the lore, but if someone gets bit by a vampire, usually they're just finished. So that was always really cool that Jimmy was able to disinfect the wounds and save himself. So he makes it. 
he and Ben decide that they have to come up with a story so that they won't get in trouble, Lauren won't get in trouble, whatever. And they decide to just kind of make it uh, like a, the, whoever's doing the body snatching, you know, they're going to kind of leave it vague enough and open-ended so that the police will think that whoever's been snatching all these bodies is the person who broke in and stole Mrs. Glick's body. So the police come and, you know, they tell them someone broke in, stole the body. Poor Maury Green is standing there like, I know you guys are lying, but I don't know why you're lying. This is very awkward. And when Ben finally gets back to his room, quote, he slept the rest of the night with the desk lamp on and left the tongue depressor cross that had vanquished Mrs. Glick on the table by his right hand on page 410. And then we are on chapter 12, which is Mark. So Mark had also been out in the woods by the Marsden house, and he saw Susan approaching the house. Quote, he decided they had to team up. Anything would be better than going up to that house alone, on page 414. So the two of them briefly chat. Susan mentions to him that, you know, there are some people in town who suspect that there might be vampires in the lot, and she is there to take care of things. Which, I don't know why she just didn't wait. But anyway, the two of them break into the house together through a window. And it's dusty, smelly, and really disorderly. Mark even finds a book that has a photo in it of a naked man holding a disemboweled child out to something. He's like offering it as a sacrifice. So they proceed to the kitchen and decide that they're going to go down into the cellar because Mark is convinced that's where Barlow would be. So as they're ready to head down, Straker ambushes them from behind. So he takes Susan down to the cellar and he takes Mark upstairs to where Hubie Marston killed himself. Straker ties Mark up. Mark had been reading about Houdini and how he used to get out of being tied up. So he implements this trick and when he's getting tied up, he puffs out all of his muscles and he holds his breath and puffs his chest out and all that stuff. And he manages to free himself after. It's quite a lengthy description, but it's really interesting how Mark gets himself free from these ropes. So Mark frees himself pretty much just before sunset. And right after he gets free, he tries the window, sees that it's, it's um, nailed shut so he can't get out and he hears Straker's footsteps coming up the stairs. So he goes over to this iron cot frame that's on the, in the room with him, and he unscrews a leg. And as soon as Straker opens the door and is kind of stunned because Mark is no longer tied up where he left him, Mark whacks him over the head with this iron cot leg and pretty much knocks Straker out, smashes him a few more times, and kills him. So he goes down to the cellar door, and it's dark, and he manages to step a little bit down, like one or two steps down into the cellar, and quote, to go back down into that cellar and try to save Susan meant induction into the ranks of the undead. That's page 435. So he yells for Susan to run, and Susan answers him, but in like a dazed kind of disoriented voice and all of a sudden there's a big noise and it's presumably Barlow who has woken up and Susan screams. Barlow calls up to Mark, tries to get him to come down and Mark runs away. So that night Susan visits Mark outside of his window just like Danny Glick had done and begs him to let her in and he doesn't. He puts his little cross up against the window and she, you know, freaks out and goes away. So he decides that he has to go in search of Ben because he's seen Ben and Susan around and he figures that's probably the most likely person who would know about the vampires. So then as he's heading to bed, he worries that, you know, maybe Susan has already visited Ben. So chapter 13 is Father Callahan and 
Father Callahan has visited Matt in the hospital. Matt has accumulated a huge assortment of books about vampires, and he is going to talk to Father Callahan about vampires being in the lot. So he asks him, you know, have you noticed anything weird around here? You know, like, think some things are going on. And he tells Father Callahan everything. So I find Callahan to be a very likable character. And he is very knowledgeable. He's very multidimensional. He is not, he has flaws, which I appreciate. He's very intelligent. And I think he's a great addition to their little vampire hunting circle. And um, after everything is explained to him, he agrees that he's going to help them out. And he suggests that they meet with Straker so that Straker can say, you guys are weird. I am a normal dude. You know, please leave me alone now. And Father Callahan has a sense of like purpose, I guess, because remember he wanted to fight evil. That was like his thing. He wanted to to fight real evil and you know this is kind of his his chance so as he leaves the hospital and he's got this mission i guess to go on he feels kind of exhilarated and full of life he's not very worried but then all of a sudden he has this terrible sense of dread that just engulfs him and quote the terror he felt was for his immortal soul. That's on page 456. We have our vampire hunters now. We've got Matt and Ben, Mark, Father Callahan, and Susan. And they're all good in their own way. Susan, I think, is an idiot for having gone up to the house on her own. I don't understand why she wouldn't just wait. Even if she didn't, fully believe the story, there's enough, there are enough coincidences and occurrences that would give me pause where I would not just march up to that house and investigate. It just, it really bothers me. I find all of them to be very likable, even Susan. She's just a little trying sometimes, but uh, Father Callahan, I really enjoy Father Callahan's part in this story, and I'm very excited to tell you that he appears in another book, which makes me happy. Because I think at one point I had heard that Stephen King had considered writing something about Father Callahan, but then he ended up not doing it. There was going to be some sort of sequel to Salem's Lot, but then he ended up just making... Father Callahan, a character in one of the Dark Tower books. So I really would have been interested in a sequel. Maybe it's better because it is my favorite. So maybe it's better that there wasn't a sequel. But that is all for this video. Have a spooky day.